Hey guys, welcome to book review number 49. Uh, today I'm going to be reviewing Late Homecomer, a Hmong Family Memoir by Cal Kayla Yang. I'm also going to be playing a little uh, background music to add some ambience. Um, okay, so this book is about uh, a Hmong family, specifically a Hmong girl, that's why it's a memoir, um, who during uh, Kao Kayla Yang's uh, early life fled, well actually before she was even born, but we'll get into that, uh, her parents fled Laos after the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, this being because the Hmong uh, had fought alongside the Americans in the war against uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh and the communists and uh, I forget what their exact name was in um, Laos but the you know the equivalent communist group in Laos um, and so when the Americans left obviously the Vietnamese and the La uh, Laotians um, wanted to exact revenge upon these people. So that's kind of like what the first, maybe third of the book is about. Um, maybe fourth of the book um, is about her parents' escape and uh, kind of the hardships but idealistic lifestyle that they led. Uh, they talk a lot about how um, the mother and the father met. Um, they also just talk about how during the escape, it wasn't like one straight line where they just walked right across the border, but was actually a number of years of kind of um, evading the authorities within Laos uh, that obviously wanted to punish them, probably execute the men uh, who would have known, known what would happen to like the women and the children and stuff. Um, and it should be said that uh, Kayla's father did not actually fight with the Americans, but just because he was of the ethnic minority, which, uh, and the slide's kind of bright, uh, the ethnic minority, which uh, fought with the Americans, he was just kind of lumped in by association. Um, and so eventually what happens is they have one child in Laos who's Kayla's older sister, um, whose name I can't recall, um, sorry. Uh, and then they cross the border and go into a Thai refugee camp where um, they live for like seven years. I think it's like about seven years. And that's where Kayla is actually born and has her you know, first childhood memories, um, you know, the, those early years. Uh, one of the things that she mentions during this time period was uh, her grandmother, who plays a very important role within this book. Um, her grandmother being a traditional medicine healer, uh, and she actually covers a lot more about her grandmother later on, sort of like retrospectively. Um, but, you know, she has just a regular experience. One thing that really stood out for me is what she said was, um, a lot of people think that, like, being a refugee is like this escape on the run kind of thing. Uh, it's very harrowing, and at times it is. Um, specifically, I'll say, well, okay. So uh, what, what she said at the Thai refugee camp, though, was that uh, how boring it was most of the time. You know, um, most of the men would only have menial jobs, and a lot of the necessities of life were provided by aid organizations without a whole lot of expected in return. So there just seemed to be like a lot of waiting now. Uh, what I think prevented a lot of these people from just completely losing it and going insane is that uh, they had their culture. They had their Hamon culture that kind of instructed them what to do and how to act as a community. Um, one thing about these refugee camps is that they tended to be fairly um, ethnically monotonous. Uh, here, I'm going to play this song again. It tended to be fairly ethnically monotonous. Um, not a whole lot of variety of ethnicities, primarily Hmong. You know, there were also other refugees of um, Laotian, um, you know, if they were in with the um, American government or whatever. But uh, because there was this uniformity, they could really apply their Hmong culture, if not, you know, actually 
um, have the true underpinnings of a, a completely stable society because a lot of it was being provided by these organizations, but the, the, all those little side things uh, kept the people in check, I guess you'd say. Um, and specifically what they mentioned was the uh, grandma. I am going to get back to that, the heroin case in a second. But, uh, you know, the grandmother was a herbal healer that really passed along a lot of uh, her knowledge to her children, not only of her profession, but also just uh, um, how to go through hardships in life, which obviously being a Hmong peasant, you know, just a um, rice farmer, I guess you will you'll say. Uh, in small town Laos, you have your uh, fair share of uh, you know, hardships or whatever. Um, yeah, her grandma just passed on a lot of knowledge and, uh, and information. Um, particularly in a circumstance where a lot of people sort of felt out of their depth. Um, not that they were starving, but that, like, this was not a normal circumstance to be in this um, refugee camp in Thailand when uh, for generations, your family had done the same thing since the beginning of time in Laos. Um, okay, so let's go back a little bit. Let's go to the, the heroin story. Like I said, they went to the refugee camp in Thailand uh, after crossing the Mekong River, which is the um, sort of border between, I think for most or a good chunk of the distance between Laos and Thailand. And they actually had to... I think they like swam it, maybe? Um, and they did it in the middle of the night, and one of the things that was actually lost when they swam it was they had this amulet, or this you know big giant necklace uh, that was a wedding necklace between the father and the mother, and that actually sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Um, but more harrowing was the, the fact that um, there were these border patrols from Laos that were trying to catch these people. And actually, one of the brothers, uh, this is a um, not, not one of Kayla's brothers. Kayla only had one other sister at this point, but the, one of the parents' brothers. So there were like seven or eight of them who were all, I think, like between 50 and, or between like 45 and 25 uh, at this point, um, being parents. Uh, one of their families got caught and actually was able to escape a second time, which I was shocked by. Just because I would think that if you got caught the first time, they would ship you to the interior and just never let you out and just be under constant watch. But uh, essentially, when they were caught, they were temporarily held in a place very close to the river and actually escaped and talked a, uh, a Thai uh, boatsman into getting it. Okay, well, anyway, eventually the uh, time at the refugee camp ends um, and they move on. And one of the things she mentions is that the grandmother moves uh, with one of these other brother families, like the next generation up, uh, to California. And uh, um, Kayla's, Kalia's, I think that's what you say, uh, family moved to Minnesota, um, which Kayla said was both very traumatic in the immediate and knowing that was going to happen, and then also kind of very isolating for the family when it eventually did happen. Um, and this gets to the part of the book that I had uh, a little bit more trouble with, just because I'm very much into these uh, travel narratives, um, into, frankly, uh, Asian narratives, Australian narratives. I mean, that's really what I like studying. Um, Oceania, you know, like South Pacific kind of stuff. And kind of part of what this book did was it confirmed it confirmed why I don't particularly find American memoir narratives all that interesting is because while they're very, very harrowing and very um, admirable they really don't have a lot of variety in, in them to me. To me it mostly just feels like family from foreign culture moves to the United States. Family from foreign culture struggles to assimilate. Um, family from foreign culture takes kind of the 
scraps of the society. Family from foreign culture works very hard. Family from foreign culture eventually finds some solace and eventually gains some measure of success, even if it isn't, you know. That success can vary, but, you know, there's always some sort of, like, um, consolidation period where um, what they've worked so hard for, what they've struggled for this entire time kind of comes into fruition. Now, it doesn't always, but that tends to be more often than not the narrative. And the problem with that is that you can fit a German narrative, you can fit a Hmong narrative, you can fit a Chinese narrative, you can fit an African narrative, you can fit a Brazilian narrative uh, into that group. And so long as they're, you know, impoverished coming in, they're not like from some wealthy family, they're, they're always going to be similar. And it seems that the um, window dressing is the culture instead of being sort of the way they live their lives is um, deeply derived from the culture itself. Now, that's not to say that um, there weren't some things that really were in the Hamon culture that helped them get through these hard times, but it's, it's, it's sort of like that, that may have been like a bridge, like the, the culture may have been a bridge that helped them get through, particularly like the, the family aspect of it, which really played strong in this book, which I thought was very good. But the narrative of struggle and overcoming struggle is universal. It's, a, it's an American narrative. And like I said, while that's harrowing and while that's good, it really doesn't provide much variety or um, make things interesting. So, I don't know. Maybe that's my white upper middle class perspective or middle class perspective that becomes so jaded that I can't understand uh, the deep meaning of what that actually means. But I think I have a point too and that is just a lot of it's the same. Okay, that being said, that, that was very critical and cynical of me. That being said, with that narrative in place, the uh, writing that actually took place in this book, the uh, reflection of um, the families, uh, the detail of what it's like in the winters in Minnesota being caught out in the cold, or, um, you know, like living in a moldy, probably asbestos-filled um, 30-year-old house. Uh, that's all very... I'm sorry, guys, I want to make sure this is not too hot. That's all very uh, real. Um, and very well written, I should say. Um, yeah, and kind of the book goes through their middle period. Uh, you know, obviously the girls struggle in school. Um, more members are brought into Kayla's generation. So they have Kayla's older sister, her, she's the second oldest. And then they have like four or five more kids. So they have like a bunch of kids, which is real interesting. I also thought it was interesting. It was, you know, she's only about five years older than I am. And a lot of the kids that came in later generation are about as old as I am. So shows what I've done in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, like the house, what, what were some of the other things they talked about? Just like the struggle to find a job, the struggle to get off welfare, you know, um, it just seems like those are American narratives. And it's harrowing that, that this family can get off welfare and that maybe their culture can push them in some sort of work ethic that, that has them do this. And I'll, by the way, I'm not being demonstrative and saying that they were on welfare. I mean, um, I, I think that's just base for people that uh, just kind of poo-poo that, especially when you don't know a language, have had really no formal training, and just come in and use welfare for, I mean, it's really a, a, a classic story of what welfare should be used for, and that people that are in struggling circumstances can better themselves over time and eventually get off welfare um, and be a productive member of society, you know, American narrative. Um, let's see here. Uh, ooh, yikes. Camera shaking a little bit. Um, yeah, and then sort of the book ends, I guess we're on about 15 minutes now, so that's good. Um, the book ends with the death of the uh, grandmother, um, which by this point the grandmother had moved to Minnesota because Min uh, California kind of shut down a lot of their uh, welfare policies in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, 
I not shut them down, but made them more restrictive to the point that it was causing strife for the rest of the family in California. And so, like the the higher generation or the generation above Kayla's, a lot of them moved to Kayla. And actually, the grandmother lived with Kayla for a while. Uh, and of course, it, the um, the end. It's very kind of bittersweet. I mean, I think Kayla knew that her grandma was eventually going to die. She knew she was much older than she was. Um, but, you know, it's sort of a, not just an American tale, but at this point a universal tale of um, family coming together with, at the death of a loved one and um, really trying to be there for one another, particularly something that came through, I think that's true in all Asian cultures, not just in Hmong culture, is the um, large feasts that took place. Um, not quite in celebration, but it's almost like, uh, almost in competition to one another. Now, not a, not a joyous competition, but a competition where everyone wants to um, bring a lot of food to the funeral, to the uh, events surrounding the funeral, um, the wake or whatever. Um, and not to be outdone by their brothers and sisters, you know, just kind of, um, yeah. So there was that aspect of it. Um, so overall, yeah, I'd say this is a pretty good book. Um, it's just, it's not necessarily my genre, but if you like sort of the um, immigrant's tale coming to America, and see, you do see some of the uh, horrific aspects back in Laos, but if you really want the immigrant's tale, the, the family, the family is definitely emphasized all the way through from uh, when the parents met in the forest in Laos when they were running from the Laotian uh, military all the way to the grandma's funeral in the end. Um, I would recommend this book. Um, yeah, I don't know. I enjoyed reading it. It just wasn't quite up my alley in terms of genres that I like reading. So, The Late Homecomer, a Hamong Family Memoir. Um, I won't call it the great American tale, but maybe the great Hamong American immigrant tale. Yeah, that might be accurate. Okay, well anyway, uh, I'll see you guys later and uh, post this review in a bit, so bye.